Welcome to Leading is Serving, episode number two. Number two. We made it. Yes. We made it. Second time. Here <laughs> we go. Time. You didn't get rid of me after the first <laughs> one. I know. Well, hey, um, day after Halloween. Yes. We got to hang out at a trunk or treat last night. Yeah. That was kind of fun. Did you get your sugar rush on? I, yeah. 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 I know you tried to prevent. What's from, your go-to? Prevent it from eating any candy. And I was like sitting there pounding the gummy bears. <laughs> gummy bears. <laughs> right. I was looking for the Reese's and the Twix. Yeah. That um, and Kit Kats. Oh, those are good too. Uh, See, I had Kit Kats in my trunk. Did you grab some? Oh, I didn't know that. You, I oh, well, you know what? I think I did see those, and I didn't. I meant to grab some. All I had to do was bump my son out of the way and grab right. them. <laughs> I ended up with M&Ms at the end of the night because the Twix were all gone. I was like, ah. Yeah. Oh. My daughter and her friends came back over to the, and started trading candy, so I started grabbing candy out of our bowl that we were giving to other kids and trading for the one candy there that I go. wanted. Nice, <laughs> nice. Well, so. I heard, I mean, if you were um, planning on doing some handing out of candy last night at Trick or Treat, I heard that grocery stores were, like, wiped out. Really? Yeah, that, like, if you waited to the last minute to pick up your candy, it was gone. And so I was glad we <laughs> – let me rephrase that. I was glad my wife thought in advance. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it would have oh, been me at uh, about 4.30 yep. running over to the grocery store. So That actually was me. Was I it? don't think it was quite 4.30, but it was earlier in oh, the day. Oh, you found some? I did find some. Oh, wow. But it was it was definitely picked over. That is for sure. Okay. okay. Yeah, so, and I was like, well, this isn't really for me anyways, even though it's, yeah. if it doesn't. It, you know. I mean, the community that we were doing this for, um, we ended up having too much candy. Yes. And so our the group leader took some extra candy home, and it's like, man, you could turn that into a fundraiser, right. you know, like scalping tickets outside the Colts right. game or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> How much would you have paid for a Kit Kat at right. the end of the night? <laughs> uh, oh man! So, uh, good well, times. hey, thanks for joining back in with us this week. We're um, we're interviewing Eric Vermillion, Eric, yep, and uh, talking with him, and uh, yeah, we're really excited about where where this is going and kind of yes. how this is shaping out, and so. We just want to encourage you, you know, as we think about leadership, that, you know, as, as we think about leading is serving, that we want to be a healthy leader. Right. I mean, coming out of COVID especially, I mean, this has been a time where our personal health has just been on attack. Well, I, I mean, there's a lot of people that have struggled with mental health and, and you know, all this. Absolutely. There's, I mean, and as a, as a leader, as a whole, you know, you have to deal with these different facets of your lives to help make sure you're a strong leader and it's it's not easy is it jason absolutely not at all <laughs> i don't feel like it is so yeah i mean and if we think about leadership on a scale of like zero to a hundred um you know i think healthy leadership probably starts somewhere around the 70s you know okay. 70s and 80s that that you're you're doing pretty good you're you're feeling healthy you feel like you've got some energy and you've this got... is like a scale of like one to a hundred yeah zero yeah one to a hundred okay and so in that 70s and 80s range, you feel like, I've got some stuff I can bring to the table. I've got some energy. I've got some ideas. I've got, I've got a little bit of bandwidth I can play with. And you know, if we think about that leadership in terms of health, it's probably that we're, well, then we throw some math in, which I'm not great at math. But, right. We'll keep that out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can edit that part out. Right. Uh, <laughs> that you're probably into additive type leadership. That when you're healthy in that 70, 80% of health, mm -hmm. um, it's like saying, you know, hey, Chris, I'm... You know, would love to chat anytime you need to about the business. Just give me a call. Let's do lunch. But you, you know, initiate that with me. Mm -hmm. That I can add into your story, into your journey. But um, I'm a, you know, my door's always open. Give mm -hmm. me a call anytime you want. Kind of idea. And the goal is that if we can push the envelope of health in our lives, that if we're truly leaning into healthy leadership in our lives, and we get up in that upper 80s, 90 percent, you know, going on 100 percent healthy, we become multiplying leaders. That it's not just about, hey, our door is open, come find me, but a 100x leader, somebody that's sitting at that 100%, they begin multiplying that leadership into others. They're the ones initiating going, hey, let's let's grab some lunch. I'm, you know, let's, how can I help you? How can I pour into your journey and things like that? And I, you know, I just want to encourage us that, you know, to begin taking those steps toward health and our leadership. Would that mm -hmm. make a difference in your businesses? Oh my goodness. I think so. I mean, and just trying to, I mean, the bandwidth of being able to do that, the difference between the 80% and the 100%, like being able to take on and help others like that, I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. And the, I'm, I gotta be honest with you, Jason, I'm not sure I'm there. It's, it's, well, it's, it's, it's a growth. 
I guess. That's well, absolutely. And, and, and life happens. Right. I mean, so if you're sitting at 92% health, if, right. you know, if you want to, you I'm know, grade sure it I'm that there. way, <laughs> I mean, man, you know, <laughs> you know, one kid gets sick. Right. And suddenly your health starts dipping because, well, you've got, you've got someone in your family who's hurting. And mm-hmm. you're taking care of them, and you're pouring that energy and time into them. And, you know, and crises, big crises come along. Yeah. Other opportunities come along that may distract us from our, our, our real goals. Right. You know, and so some of those things, I mean, our health is going to fluctuate weight all the time. I mean, I'm not going to – I'd love to grow to be 98, 99, 100% healthy and stay there. Mm-hmm. But I know, that, I know that my health as a leader is yeah. always going to fluctuate. And the downside is that, that there is unhealthy leadership. You know that um, our energy can be depleted, our, our our personal health, our you know maybe we're struggling financially. You know something hit in the business that's just you know it's just making it hard right now. And so right. we dip down below that seventy percent of health, and we kind of end up in this subtractive type leadership that we're we're just looking to draw energy from any source we can mm-hmm. because we're we're burned out, we're tired, we're depleted. Right. We just, how are we going to, how are we going to make it, you know? And, right. and so we start pulling energy from other sources and maybe that's when we start leaning into, um, distractions that just promote further unhealth, <laughs> whether mm. those are vices or, you know, you know, I'm not going to do anything this weekend. I'm just going to binge Netflix right. all weekend. Right. Right. <laughs> when it probably would have been healthier to spend an hour to, to get a couple things maybe done. set priorities for the next week, you right. know, that, you know, and so we can end up subtracting from the people around us because we're not healthy. Mm. And even worse than that, if we're, you know, sitting down at the bottom of the barrel in our, you know, teens, 20, 30% of, of unhealth, then we become divisive. That our attitudes, the words we use, the way we live just hurts others and probably mm. hurts our own businesses. I would completely agree. Yeah. You, know, you bring leader, you bring divisive leadership into the teams and organizations that you're part of mm-hmm. and, you're just gonna you're just gonna build walls between you and those around you, and success is gonna be just so much harder to get there. And so it's funny you should bring this up right now because I had a meeting this morning with um, somebody who was not. I wouldn't say that they were in the negative spot, but they were definitely in an unhealthy spot. If that mm-hmm. makes sense, I don't know where I would put them on that scale. But it was just I sat down with this person and just had a conversation about, hey, you know what, you probably need to set some of these priorities in place and then work from those and slowly, progressively right. try to get back to a full-scale setup because you're in a position now where it's just it's just not healthy for you to continue doing what you're doing. So take the time out for you as, as a leader right. to make sure that what you're bringing to the table is not divisive, is not mm-hmm. I'm trying to suck the energy out of this right. kind of thing. Well, and we need to understand that it's okay to, like you said, back off just a little bit. Mm -hmm. If we've got five main priorities that we're really gunning for, and we understand that in ourselves, man, this week I am, I'm dipping, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm dropping below the health line. It's okay to pull back for a week or two Mm -hmm. and just focus on the two, maybe three things that are really, you know, at the core and let those other couple things wait. It's Mm -hmm. okay to, we don't have to drive ourselves to the brink of exhaustion and burnout and right. unhealth. Right. I mean, our health is more important than the results in our businesses. Mm-hmm. Oh, I completely agree. Completely yeah. agree. Because if you lose, I mean, if you self destruct, it's yeah. all it's all gone. It's all gone. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I, it's it's. I think it's great that we're talking about this because our next guest has gone through some things and isn't a good is a great leader and has. I would say he's in close to the 100% guy. I mean, 100, 100x times guy. Yeah. He is just, um, he is pouring into other people and reaching out to them as well as other people are reaching out to him. Right. So I'm super excited. Did you want to tell us who we're getting ready to talk to this guy, <laughs> this fat of this guy? <laughs> yeah, we um, interviewed Eric Vermillion, mm-hmm. who has been in uh, corporate banking, like commercial um, the commercial side of banking for a lot of years mm-hmm. and uh, launched his business at, I think he said, the most opportune time of right two months before the pandemic. Right. And if that's not something, um, goodness gracious. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you weren't healthy as a leader going into the pandemic, um, I mean, his business survived. Yes. It survived. It it's amazing. Going on two years. And so I think this is a great picture. And I think uh, 
And I would he, say he's he's just as healthy now as he was when he went in. Yeah. I mean, just just in that and his testament or his uh, two years of staying alive during a midst of a pandemic. Right. Ha, as a serious testament to that. Absolutely. So let's listen so, in. All right. Here we go. Eric Vermillion. Did I say that right? You did. All right. One L. Thanks for joining us. My whole uh, my whole life. There you go. <laughs> One L. One L. <laughs> One L. And uh, Eric, how long have you been around uh, the South Side Indy? You grow up here? No, I no? grew up. I grew up in Upland, Indiana. Very good. So who's your by nature then? Yeah. Okay. Taylor University is where Upland is, which is yeah. up north, uh, halfway to Fort Wayne from Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know it. Yeah. Went yeah, to Franklin yeah. College, and that's how I got. Uh, myself okay. further south. Okay. Been here on the south side ever since Franklin? Kind of. Kind One of. year in Terre Haute for a job, which is crazy. Uh, <laughs> things we do for jobs. Um, but yeah, I mean, Johnson County mostly. Okay. Franklin and yeah. Center Grove, where we live now. All right. Well, tell us about uh, family. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. My wife is uh, owner of a home cleaning business here in Center Grove. And uh, she's not really adding clients, so I'm not going to do a commercial for her. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, I have three kids, um, daughter who is a sophomore, which is nuts. Yes. Isn't that yeah. crazy? 15, yes, almost 16. Yep. Um, I remember people always saying that when, you know, when she's like seven or eight, and you're like, yeah, yeah, it is that fast, right? Yeah. Right. Um, Son who is 12, almost 13, on December 31st, and then um, son who just turned nine. Both uh, boys play soccer, and Lorelai does uh, deb tones at the high school, show choir stuff. So in your spare time from running kids around, right? what do you get to do with your life? <laughs> I, spend a lot, I spend a lot of time at the soccer fields, to be yes. honest with you. That seems to, to be one of my favorite hobbies is just being dad. Um, it is for sure. I'm just being dad. And, mm-hmm. um, while I go to the show choir stuff, my wife tends to like the show choir a little bit more naturally, but, right. uh, I did have a connection with it when I realized that it's really competitive and yeah. it's maybe even more competitive than soccer sometimes. Uh, and I'm, yeah. I'm actually very excited for the next couple of years of her doing the, the competitive stuff on, on the show choir. So, but yeah, soccer, my boys play at travel level and do well and, um, they, yeah. they're very good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they are. The, one, one, my youngest is, um, he's just got invited for the uh, MLS Next program, and he's nine. No way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. That is cool. That is cool. I had a soccer player in my family, wow. and uh, now he's... Now he's working for Chris. Yep. So, good guy. <laughs> very cool. And he is a very good guy, too. So, he's very talented. But uh, tell us about your uh, your your day job, right? My, my business, huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Vermilion Capital. We are um, brokers of commercial loans, is the easiest way to put it. USABizLoans.com is the website. Uh, we started it at the perfect time. We started it three months before a worldwide pandemic shut down Excellent. the entire world economy. Excellent timing, yeah. And you totally I mean, planned that. Oh, man. You? I mean, I, I'm like, you know what? If I go back in history, uh, <laughs> let's see. When could I start it? Well, there's 1929, and then there's now. <laughs> so, uh, so I started this business. You know, uh, the plan took time to to develop it was years in the making of when i was going to launch this thing and um it was i when i say launch this thing launch a business years in the planning mm-hmm. of i knew i was going to do something right. um i wanted to to get the release of um corporate america and uh have lots of fond memories of people and lots of not fond memories of situations mm-hmm. um that you come across and um wanted to, wanted something different you know for yeah. years and wanted that freedom now I, my understanding my impression is that a lot of people feel that same way yeah and they may plan for years but they don't actually take that step <laughs> yeah what what pushed you to make that first step um besides poor timing uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think there was a combination of um, 
So to be a little bit less humble, I was pretty good at what I did for the corporate world. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, lots of promotions, lots of records, lots of you know, um, sales, leadership development type, type things for business, for um, other people's businesses. Um, what made me do it? The, the honest answer is probably that they about killed me by just mm. keep piling on. You know things. I was running five divisions at the time I left uh, my most most previous big job, and you know when you're 25 you can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just kept going and, and got to the point where uh, it, the the return on what it was doing to my family value and you know for for me personally it just wasn't there. And I'm like you know what I got to figure out a way out and. Um, thank God for ways out mm-hmm. because it literally probably would have killed me if I would have continued to take the stress on. So I wanted a different kind of stress. I wanted a stress where I was a little bit more in control. Um, you know, I didn't like the stress of you get, get fired. I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody likes that stress. Right. Um, but it, it grew on me while expectations grew dramatically higher and performance was good, but it was, you know, over 50 people that are reporting to you. It, it gets stressful, mm-hmm. different different things to, to juggle. So um, for me, it was, <laughs> I, think, I think it was a necessity to go out. And that was why even when the world economy shut down, uh, I didn't stop trying to do what I was doing. I didn't do it very well. I mean, nobody did it extraordinarily well, but... Um, very few did. There were some, mm-hmm. um, but startups in in that time period, most of them failed. Mm-hmm. Most of them failed out of the gate, right? right? Um, and I would say through stubbornness and planning and being prepared financially, um, for the ups and downs, and my wonderful wife being awesome and continuing mm-hmm. to do her business, um, we persevered. So, what would you say to somebody who's felt that? that pain and uncomfortableness of being in a corporate environment, feeling that stress. Cause I mean, I, I right off the bat, I mean, I can, I know I can list some people that are feeling that stress as well, but what would you say to them that would prep them for an opportunity to even consider doing what you've, you know, step out of it for a different stress? Hmm. Have a plan. Um, have a financial plan first, I think, is because it's not real until it's a financial plan because we all have responsibilities, right? We all mm-hmm. have a house payment. We all have a whatever. Family. Family, we, kids, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You name it. And life's expensive, right? And it's right. only getting more expensive as we've all seen in 5% inflation markets. We feel it. Um, have a plan. Have a long-term plan. Expect your business not to work financially. It's not going to work for a while. Uh-huh. Um, don't expect to take money out of your business. Be ready to throw every money, every bit of money you put back back into the business, um, and get to the point where you can do that. If that means selling your cars, if that means you know selling your house and living in an area that you didn't think was awesome, if that means renting a house for a while while you start a business, have the um, uh, have the monetary situated. The finances have to be situated for you to be at peace to start a business. So at some level, I hear you saying sacrifice is definitely a real thing in the idea of stepping out of this stress, but potentially taking on this stress, there's a significant oh, sacrifice. No doubt, it. no doubt about it. Okay. No doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah, but be prepared. I mean, talk to people like me, people, people who've done it, people who, you know, I obviously we're – we're finance guys. Um, that's our business is, you know, I taught people how to start businesses for years through my work with credit unions and banks. And um, so I knew that for me to actually get to this point was, <laughs> it's not, it's not, um, it's not hard to, to, to be honest with you and say that it was 15 years in the making to get out of corporate America. 
and it took that long. From, from the twinkle of your eye to the actual moving forward. I, I think from the first day I realized, oh my gosh, I don't have control and this is not good for my soul. And mm. um, I need to figure out a way out of, out of this eventually. doesn't mean today. And when you're in your 20s, you don't necessarily need it. But the closer you get to your 40s and <laughs> 50s right. probably eventually, uh, I think the more you realize if I'm going to ever be an entrepreneur, it's got to be now. I got to mm-hmm. get to that point and I got to have a plan. Um, so, but I mean, also I grew businesses for other businesses. That makes sense. Like right. I was, I was scratching that itch of, of entrepreneurial, um, feelings that I needed to have through those businesses. What got me was the success was, was so great many times that the, the ask of me from bosses were like, well, if you can do this, well, do this. Well, if you can do that, do that. And it just kept going. And it was wonderful. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. you know. Those are pay raises. Those are, you know, career events and celebrations with teams and all that stuff. That's awesome until it just gets so high that it's like, eh, mm-hmm. they have a choice if I go start off over another career someplace else at a, where, where they don't know where I, what I can do and start and then build it from there, or I start it for myself. Mm-hmm. And I always had always had to start it for myself and in, in back of my head. In the back of your head. Yeah. Yep. Now, you mentioned a couple of times that – you wanted to fight for values in your life that uh, you use the phrase uh, that fed my soul. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of those values that for you to win in those areas completely overwhelmed the potential financial pain, startup pain, sacrifice that winning was so important with those values? So um, this is a good way to explain my business because there's, when I got to the to this point, and I'll tell the story. I, I um, and I, don't, I wish I could remember the book because I read. I, I when I went on this, you know, I'm not going to work for somebody else anymore. Journey. Mm-hmm. Um, I sat down, read some books. You know, how do you do this, right? Like, how do you really, really do this? And I took a piece of paper and went to like a Starbucks or I think it was actually a Strange Brew. There's a there's a hit um, for Strange Brew. Sat down with a piece of paper and a coffee, and it was white piece of paper and a, and a pencil, pen. And it was, uh, the advice of the book was take back through your, go back on a mental journey through your, um, wh- where you've worked and think about all the things that they're not very good at. And just start writing down what these companies were not good at. And that's where your business ideas might, might come from because if you could be better at that by specializing in it, that might be, you know, a business for you. Right. So went through and... Um, the business I, I settled on was number seven, by the way. Hmm. Um, and the, the idea was you uh, take those ideas and then you write a business plan based on that idea, right? So you take that and you're like, okay, let me live with this for a while. Let me call Chris and say, hey, Chris, what do you think about if I did this? And get somebody you trust that knows you and knows your personality and your, you know, enough that says, dude, that's horrible. Why would you do that? You would hate that. And that's what you that's what I hope for when I sent these to like to to friends and would call friends and be like, hey, I wanted to do this. I want to um, open a pet shop. I don't, you know, whatever it is, right? You came up yeah. with. Like, dude, you don't even like dogs. You know, you, you <laughs> hope that the feedback is that cl- crystal clear that right. you're like, hey, um, I can't even see you doing this. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's not you're you're on the wrong road because those failures are learning opportunities for you to get closer to what you really want to do, what you're going to be great at, what when the world economy shuts down, you continue to do, mm-hmm. right? So, um, so I thought I thought for a while I uh, um, uh, I know I knew that what I really needed to do was find something where I help people, by and, and then I have this um, uh, love for finance. I love I just really I'm a, that, that geek that gets it, that understands it, whether it's personal, whether it's business, I've always just really gravitated towards finance and mm-hmm. helping people with, with finance and not just um, not just the start out part, but the growth of it. I really have to have two things in, in my world. So you asked me what, are, what are those things. I know that I'm naturally going to come back to things that are growing. So I love to grow a garden. I love to build things. My dad, my my, every every male in my family up until me worked with their hands making things, so that's still in there, and I right. still have that. 
Mm-hmm. And so if I don't use that, it itches at me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've got, um, you know, my favorite games are building things and creating things and building cities and those, you know, I should have probably been a civil engineer at the end, at the end of the day. I probably should have went back and did that. So um, anyway, so like growing things, design, like designing things, those things have to be in there. But I, you know, my grandpa was a preacher. So I know that everything is, you've got to help people. That's your, your nature is you're going to be happy only when you're helping people. Um, mm-hmm. So those things have to be in there. And um, it had to be around finance because that's my skill set really too. I've done it for the last 25 years. Um, my contacts are all there. It's like, yeah, okay, so how do I figure this out, right? There, so I keep going down, and I'm like, okay, what didn't they do well? Well, where I came, where I came my business, my, my business came to me was when I was writing down number seven. Number seven was when a small business owner comes to a bank or a credit union, they are blind. They don't know what's on the other side of that door. They don't know how it works. It is easy for them to be taken advantage of. It's easy for them to walk in the wrong door that's going to just kill their inspiration. Um, and going through creating businesses, you start to realize how much, by the time they get to you, how much work they've done, how much dreaming they've done. Um, now, they may dream in the wrong direction because they don't have the financial part pick, you know, figured mm-hmm. out, and they're so far along, and you're like, oh, you got to bring it back here, and let's do this. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Right. Let's, before we leap, let's get this plan in order. Anyway, so people come into me and they're going in the wrong door. So um, they would half the time there was nothing wrong with your business plan, there was nothing wrong with your finances, but you were at the wrong place. Hmm. Had nothing to do with you. Now most people in commercial lending uh, are well, they're salespeople. Nobody thinks of them that way. But a commercial loan officer is a salesperson. They have a quota that they have to hit. They have to do twenty million dollars a year in commercial lending. In loans, and you're coming in with your fifty thousand dollar idea, and their goal is twenty million. What you need is the guy that's goal is four million, right? Because it matches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you came into the guy that's twenty million, and he looks at you and goes, "You know how many I have to do? I can't. I can't physically do that. I don't right. care. Mm-hmm. Like I do care, but I I don't care. Right. right? right. Nobody cares about your business as much as you care about your business. Is a is a rule." It, nobody cares about your business as much as you do. Nobody. And you're saying that majority of business owners don't understand that. They have no idea. Yeah, I would completely agree with that statement. So, um, but if you walk into that guy that's got a goal of $4 million and you're going to do a $300,000, you know, hey, that's a good chunk of my goal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, you seem like a nice guy I want to work with. Oh, they, you match what my bank wants to lend on. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, let's, Which, let's take a look. Let's start working. But what happened, what I saw was even, even the places I worked at that had good people who wanted to help people, the volume of commercial loans is, and ideas of what a commercial loan could be. So think about it, you know, of um, 10 ideas of I'm going to go talk to a banker, three of those might fund. The rest mm. of them get denied mm. and they go, eh, it's, eh, no, I guess it wasn't right. Okay. So they walk away, and they just go, I won't buy that extra tractor. Maybe it's not right. Maybe they're right. Maybe it's not the time. Well, it might have just been the wrong lender. Right. So the idea was denying people, calling up, you know, Chris and saying, Chris, you know, sorry, man. And what happens is it, it becomes, so early in their careers there, it becomes, Chris, here's my phone call. I'm great. You're great. It just doesn't work. I'm, I'm sure there's, there's somebody else out there. You know, let me know if you need anything else. That, that's kind of what the, 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 the pretty good people in the business. And then it becomes, Chris, I looked at your information, and I'm not going to call you back. And it's crickets. And you try and email people. Mm-hmm. And you try to call them. But what you don't know is you're denied because it just doesn't work doesn't fit their model or for them not for right. you not someplace else so i started thinking okay how do i make a business out of this mm-hmm. and the business is i'm your insider i'm somebody who understands uh how the the actual commercial world works and why you're getting denied or why it's hard to work here um and it is a very inefficient business 
It is ripe for the picking for somebody who wants to disrupt it. <laughs> so I think that all the time. Um, and I think in a way I am disrupting it just by inserting myself into the, into the process um, and giving that small business owner, that investor in, into um, real estate, whatever the, the kind it is of, of, of expansion. Um, I think I just insert myself in there and try and help them and make money when they have success. The only way I make money is if you get a loan, if you find the place that you want to do a loan and you do the loan with them. Otherwise, I'm just doing a lot of work for just because I love it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, you mentioned um, in the past you've been a part of leadership development in some of the, you know, you're building teams, you're building businesses, things like that. What are some leadership uh, or what is a leadership principle that has meant a lot to you over the years? That without that, even when you're when you're helping these you know young entrepreneurs coming on the scene, what do you? What's a leadership principle that you're looking for that without that, you know, we're just going to struggle. Um, Maxwell's Twenty One Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is my number one book. Always has been in my desk when I'm leading because I'm not you know. I think by nature we all think we're great leaders, but we're not. I mean, we we need to learn and grow into it. Don't we? We got we got to learn and we got to. Re- <laughs> and those, you know, those situations let you, um, if you can, if you take the time and step back and realize you're not always that great at it, mm-hmm. you can learn. And I kept it close enough that I can re- remind myself. Um, law of navigation have have a plan, you know. <laughs> um, this is number one, and then just. Determination is, you got to be stubborn and you got to, you got to be willing to work when it seems like you should give up. And that's usually when you should work harder. And so those leadership skills of, of, um, helping people who are going for goals themselves that they didn't think that they could get to. And if you have a leader who believes in you, then that helps. You almost, when you're running your own small business, you got to be that leader. You got to believe that you got to believe you can do the things that you don't believe you can do. And it's, that's the hard part about owning your own business because it's not easy. Mm-hmm. There are days you are depressed because your business and your, your phone's not ringing and you're like, am I really even doing a business? Especially during a pandemic. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when nobody's looking for a loan. When nobody, well, no small business, nobody wants to, you know, the, nope. the number one, nobody, everybody's afraid of everything. Mm-hmm. Number two, lenders stop lending. So the products that I developed to help people that I knew was going to help Jason when he walked in the door right. stopped being there. Like It's like you went to Walmart and there's nothing on the shelf. What am I going to sell you? Well, ah. I, drove, I just drove by all the car lots out on 31. There's nothing. No, nope. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. And now, yeah, and now, so, so imagine that you're, you know, you're trying to sell cars, right? That's what it was last year with mm-hmm. I started this business. I created um, – I spent time on the East Coast, met with – one-on-one with lenders and said, okay, what do you really want? What's your sweet spot? If I bring this loan to you, are you going to do it? No. Why? It's too small. Now, they won't say that to you. Right. But they will say it to an we'll insider. To, yeah, yeah. to a guy who's had the same goals they have, who's done – who sat in the same meetings and can relate to – if Bob's having a bad day, that loan's not getting through. Mm-hmm. And it's literally that. Yeah. It's something like that. Oh, you didn't say hi to Bob at the coffee yesterday. Uh, <laughs> he's mad at you. And now you bring this loan that's a little bit iffy. I swear to you. Or you're on the wrong side of of the teams. You report to this person, not me. So I'm not going to really go, on, go out. I mean, uh, internal politics matters immensely on especially the higher million dollar plus loans. And so knowing who has the ability to approve loans. So there's guys, you know, um, there's a guy that I met with who can approve up to $750,000 on behalf of his lender. Doesn't have to go to anybody else. Hmm. Nice. Okay. And then, okay, so then the next one is guy comes in, he wants to do a million dollar plus loan. If I take it to a separate lender, you know, they look the same from the outside. You would never know. The president of the board, the president of, of the bank, and four other people have to vote to approve it. 
after they've done a full analysis on the finances. Oh, wow. wow. Okay, your odds go down drastically. Absolutely. When you get that many people who are trying to prove that they know what the heck they're doing, by the way, is most of the time what's going on. <laughs> it's on film. <laughs> um, one so, L. Vermillion one, with one, one L. L. <laughs> <laughs> Notice I haven't mentioned any former employ- employers. Right. <laughs> uh, and they've been great, by the way. Um, but go go back and look at it and go, who who is most likely going to give you the odds? So it's a, it's an almost like an odds maker. I'm like I'm mm-hmm. I'm really shepherding people through a process that they know nothing about, and I had no no idea. And I, you know I'm sure there are a million different ways that in my life that somebody has done this for me, and I don't even realize it. Right. Um, so that's it. That's I get paid to help okay. people get through a, a very complicated, hard process that is very complicated and is very hard and it's very inefficient and takes a ton of determination. Yeah. Hmm. So what do you see other people underestimate about themselves or maybe even their business plans um, that you wish that, man, if we could just get this right, um, we'd see success? Um, okay. So one of my favorite um, stories was we were helping a local brewery when I was at my old job. And I went to um, talk with him about, you know, his business. And we were about two years into his business. And I said, I asked him a somewhat similar question. I said, okay, this is this is funny. You're asking me somewhat similar question. And he, and he said, um, we spent. And he goes, I can remember the hours we spent. Eighteen hours in planning for when this thing fails. Like when it fails, because we knew it was not going to, I mean, everybody was going to have, you know, okay, my house is involved in this. Uh, Billy's selling his car to get us enough money to do this. We are scraping this together. And when you, when you have partners, mm-hmm. it's hard uh, and sometimes not successful. <laughs> right. Um, but it was like, okay, who's putting what in? Okay, we're meeting with the lawyers to make sure that when I exit this thing, I, Here's the plan for it. And he, and he said, and we spent almost no time talking about when this thing goes crazy and is successful like crazy. What do we do? And I thought about that several times. And I, when I was coaching small businesses, I'm, I, I thought about, okay, make sure you plan for huge success too. Right. Not just your huge failure when it doesn't work. Right. But what if this thing hits? You know, what are, you, what are your resources for when it hits? What's your game plan for when it hits, when it works the way it's supposed to work? You know, what's your plan for that? If they planned 18 hours on their exit strategy, how many hours should they have put toward the success side? I don't know. A one-to-one? Probably a one-to-one. Yeah. I would think so. Okay. Um, I, pl- I planned a lot on structure of how I would do it. Like, I just thought about the business, and I thought about – Okay, how would I actually just perform this? Like, here's day one. What do you do? Hmm. You know, what you, you, you okay? Oh, and there's this um, there's this psychological part of of owning your own business that you, um, that you have to accept the role. You don't get hired. Think about it. Think about every time you've got a job before. You've went through a process. Mm-hmm. You've made it. You've climbed this mountain. Somebody shakes your hand and says. Welcome, Mr. Manager of blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right. And even then, it takes a while because you got to train yourself. And you gotta, they got to train you. And you've got to go in there and accept your team. And you've got to build, accept the role. You've, it takes time to accept the role. Hmm. So, um, okay, today's your first day at your business. Have you accepted your role? What's your role? What's it look like? What do you do? Mm-hmm. And so those questions, um, accepting the role is a big uh, leadership thing, um, even when it's just yourself. Mm-hmm. Have you... Even when you're doing everything, huh? Well, I mean, the hardest... <laughs> well, I mean, as, a, as, an, yeah. as an early entrepreneur, right? Get, you, you know, one of those roles is everything. Yeah. Because so, it's easy to be get enamored with your product. Right. With the solution you're bringing to the market, and you're all excited about that. Right. But then you realize, 
crud, I got to also do. Yeah. And you don't realize that till day three when it's already fallen through the crack. And have you defined your role? <clears throat> did you did you have a plan for what your role would be? Did you teach your? Did you manage yourself? Right? Did you right. like if you like? Is it? I get hired. I work for you, Jason. You're gonna like, give me the list of my things yeah. I'm in charge of. I'll right. Give you a bullet list. Yeah, right. right. Absolutely. Okay. Did you do that for yourself when you started your business? Mm-hmm. So the hardest part, the hardest part for the first year was I accepted the role. I started to do the role for three months, saw what I thought was really good success for early startup business, built a pipeline of people that I was going to help. People were thanking me for doing my business, which is a wonderful feeling, one of the best mm-hmm. feelings in the world. Thank you for, for sure. doing what you're doing. Right. Oh, my gosh. That's, like, worth more than money. That's exactly right. It is. It's <laughs> worth more than money. So, so getting those things... And my pipeline died on the vine. Like, like I said, here, Jason, we're going to go through this process. You're going to buy this investment property. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a fourplex when we're done here, right? Oh, worldwide shutdown of the economy. Jason goes, no, 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 no. Lender goes, no, 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 no. And I go, oh, I only get paid if you have success. Right. Mm. And then you, and then it just, you know, everybody remembers those three, four months mm-hmm. when it was shut down, shut down. I was right. like, I'm just playing. Like, I'm literally just playing like I own a business right now. Right. Like, I, I'm not unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> but You've accepted your role already, so you can't be unemployed. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, I mean, it, it was just, it, it, thank God for my wife, continue to work. Mm-hmm. Um, thank God that I prepared for absolutely nothing to come from this, like no dollars to come from right. my business. Um, otherwise, I don't know what the heck, right? Hmm. Um, so <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> I, I think you got it. Yeah. What would uh, what would you tell 25-year-old Eric today, knowing what, you know, the, the wisdom that you know today? What would you tell him? Um... I actually think I would I would I would uh, probably tell myself to do this at thirty. Hmm. Yeah, figure out a way to get it done at thirty, and it would have been hard. I'm just thinking back, like mm-hmm. how possible it would have been, but yeah, um, y- y- something like it. Right. Like if if I wouldn't have waited till now. See, I didn't get to the commercial stuff until later in my career. Um. So number seven may not have been on the list it wouldn't at have 30. Right. It wouldn't, I wouldn't have known what I needed to know mm-hmm. to do this business at 35. Right. It was pretty much from 35 to you know, 42, something mm-hmm. like that. And I went, oh, there's an opportunity. Or, yeah, actually, at 42 was when I went, went oh, there's an opportunity. Right. You know, mm-hmm. through it. the rest of it, I'm just working, right? Right. And Sometimes it takes that time to see the opportunities, too. Right? Yeah, I mean, I feel like over the years I've grown stronger in the fact of learning things, but I don't wouldn't have known things had I not gone through some things for that time period, whatever that was, to be Absolutely. able to get to this point. So you've got to fail. Yeah, you've got. I mean, you do. You've got to. So it's hard to know at twenty five, right? But I'm, I mean, yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, I, it's it's very tough. I don't know. I think I was doing okay at 25. How about right, that? Right, I, I, I was yeah. working hard. Well, I, I was like hitting the, the numbers. Idea of telling yourself, hey, by 30, you know, you should make this happen. Yeah. yeah. Like you can do this or can buy this. Bitcoin or, or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. You right. know? Right. Right. <laughs> There's going to be this weird thing come along called Bitcoin <laughs> when it's like 0. 0.0001. Buy 100,000 of them. <laughs> right. Borrow anything and buy it. <laughs> All right. Last thing. Yeah. Little uh, lightning round. Okay. Okay. You ready for this? So these are like the best best of Eric. You ready? All right. All right. What are you streaming right now? Um, well, I was telling Chris, I was just streaming Joe Rogan's um, stuff on um, fun, the power of fungi. <laughs> That's right. The power of fungi. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Look it up on YouTube. Right. It's yeah. it's incredibly interesting. There you go. Uh, what about uh, what about movies? Netflix. Um. Prime, Apple TV. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I like okay, so I'll just give you a genre. I love space stuff. All right, there I love you go. I love SpaceX. So what am I streaming? I, I will while I'm working, I'll have SpaceX in Boca Chica on the screen in the background. There you go. With a bunch of guys just <laughs> making rockets. And I feel like kindred souls, you know, like I'm trying to build something, they're building something that's like aspirational and, and right. you know, can grow to something bigger. And it's just it's so silly. I know it is, but I have it in my my wife will walk in and go, Oh my gosh, they're not doing anything. I'm like, well, once in a while that crane will lift something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it might be the rocket that goes to Mars, man. That's I don't right. know. You never know. know. You, you never, never know. you never know. So that's that's, so that's yeah. a little bit of my weirdness. All right, I guess. Best hangout spot. Uh Strange Brew. Right. Um Taxman. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. Love Taxman. Couple of good joints here on the south side for uh, sure. Tried and true, love. Yeah, yeah. Um, those are my those are my places. Favorite plant in the garden? <sighs> oh man, these were supposed to be easy. I have a bean house. You know a what a bean, bean house? You know no. what a bean house is? Oh. I have a bean house. It's one of the coolest things I ever did. So you take two boxes, right? So they're think of them um, two by eight boxes, okay? Okay. And then you put a fence up on one side and a fence up on the other side, and they're about mm, four, four and a half, five feet wide. And then you get some fence and you put it over the top. And you plant the beans that grow up the fences on the side, and it becomes a bean house. It oh, grows cool. all the way. No way. So when you walk into it in July through September, you just pick the beans from right above your head. None of this getting down and on the ground and having How to get to it. How cool is that? It's it's one of the coolest things. So the bean house. All you right. Have to sneak in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is cool. And you mentioned playing games. What's uh, what? Uh, let's see. Favorite game. All time favorite game would be Railroad Tycoon games. Okay. I like that you can buy and sell businesses in it. <laughs> <laughs> Staying fine. There's a so. theme here. Right? <laughs> All right. Well, Eric, where uh, where can people find you? Uh, USABizLoans.com, or they can call me, 317-938-0807. Cool. Very cool. Thank you so All much. Right. Yeah. So, Eric, thank you for sharing your time with us. Appreciate it. Yeah. And, uh, Anytime. I'll come back when you have... Like cool questions again. Yeah. Lightning. Maybe we'll just do lightning around the whole, the whole, next, whole time. next time. Maybe we'll do like it on location at Tax uh, Man. Oh, yeah. Oh. There you go. <laughs> I like that. All right, man. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Thanks All right. A lot. Thank you, guys. See you. All right. That was so, good, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, Eric is a phenomenal guy. I'm super excited that you got to join us today and yeah. talk with us about his business and. Like you said, like going through the pandemic, going starting a business at the beginning of a pandemic and going into a pandemic and trying to keep it alive is just a whole nother thing. I just what's what's some of the things that you took away from it as a, as as you sat here and listened to him conversing? I mean the, with this? the commercial lending side of things is a world that I've not been a part of. I mean, I, yeah. I I just know very little about it. And so when he was talking about knocking on the right door, being you know, finding the right person behind the right door to meet, not just meet their needs, but meet your needs. Um, I thought that was huge. I thought that was a cool insight for me, at least, into that world. And that, you know, how many how many business owners, how many people with dreams? Because I I'm a dreamer by nature. I love I love thinking of ideas and seeing right? those come to reality. But um, how many times I've talked to one person and walked away going, well, clearly that that idea was junk. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's not always the case. Right. It might be for totally other reasons, and so I love to hear. I love to hear that, and I love that Eric's trying to connect the right dream with the right person who can bring that to fruition. Right, I thought that was really cool. What and about I, you? I'm, you know, that's. Um, There's a kind of. I'm just going to touch on that too. Like, it's amazing how many different lenders there are out there that he works with. That just. Um, they have niches that they are are better known for, and they're better versed to Mm -hmm. invest into, which is a whole new, I just opened my eyes completely. But I mean, and then it goes back to in my head all the time is that, you know, having a financial plan, he talks about that, you know, have a plan. Eric had a plan before he started in the midst of a, you know, two months before a pandemic hit. And the man has grown 
in two years mm-hmm. and has done an excellent job. And I know he's influenced my life um, with my businesses as well and being able to um, find the right people for the things that I want to take on mm-hmm. um, as a business owner. So Absolutely. He's, he's given me a wealth of knowledge. I know that. Right. And so it's just great to see him flourish and and, and what he does and what he's passionate about and absolutely his ability to serve our community is like a whole nother facet that I just, um, I guess I just didn't even realize, like you said, I don't know that much about commercial lending, but he is, he's got a niche all of his own that I didn't know a whole lot about. So it was great right. to talk with him. Right. And, and I love how it brought it full circle as well. That as we were talking about, uh, being a hundred X leader, being a hundred percent healthy and multiplying that leadership and others, that he saw that journey in his own life of being in corporate America is killing me. Right. I got to get out. I have, I have values. I have things more important to me than this. Right. And I can tweak this and I can start this on my own because then I can live and lean into the part of my life that makes me healthy. Right. And then he builds that into his family, into his kids. I mean, I loved it. loved his story about how he's spending more time with his kids and not feeling guilty about, <laughs> doing business, right? You know that that he can be a family man and love yeah. his family well. And I thought that was really cool. And that the, that other part of it is like he's now serving his family and serving other business owners in a completely different facet than he mm-hmm. was in that banking industry. Absolutely. And he has just brought all kinds of um, not not just financial uh, you know abilities, but just wisdom. Uh, the mm-hmm. fine, the wisdom and and that the wealth and that wisdom, um, kind of thing. It's just it, he's he is definitely serving our yeah. community. Absolutely. So hope that you can take a little bit away from the podcast today. Of um, even if you're not in commercial lending or not looking for it, it's just it's neat. Yeah, the impact that you can bring to your family, to your community, when you're living into leader, healthy leadership, right? And you're building bean houses, right? I'm going to go find me some trellis come spring, I think. There you go. (laughs) Hey, thanks for tuning in today. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.